Good morning. Uh, welcome to today's panel of peers session. Today we're going to be focused on the topic of innovation in finance. My name is Khalil Morse, Yale School of Management class of 21. Uh, I currently serve as Senior Vice President in the Technology, Media, and Telecom Group at Citigroup Capital Markets. Um, so broadly, we'll, we'll spend about uh, 30 minutes or so discussing the topic. Obviously, we want to get to know our panelists. Um, and you know, this whole series was created by students, I think, about two years ago. I think one of my colleagues at City was one of the co-founders um, to, to really provide an opportunity, a platform for us to get to know each other. Um, even though this is a relatively small cohort compared to other business schools, we're all busy, we're all working professionals, and we wanted to provide a platform so we you know, can kind of save space for people to learn and uh, discuss topics that are uh, important to them. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Jess. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Thompson. I am an investment director at IFM Investors in the Global Infrastructure Debt Group. IFM is an asset manager. We are owned by a consortium of Australian-based pension funds, and we manage approximately 90 billion under management. Um, and we invest across a number of different asset classes and strategies with the main focus on infrastructure investing. In my role, I'm responsible for sourcing and structuring investment opportunities relating to North American-based infrastructure projects, and I manage a $2.5 billion portfolio on behalf of one of our US insurance clients. Prior to my current role, I was in banking for about eight years, also doing infrastructure. I was in the Structured Power and Project Finance Group at RBS, where I was involved in capital raises, um, mostly debt capital raises for um, large-scale infrastructure projects with a focus on renewable energy and power generation. I studied public policy in undergrad at Cornell, um, always had a really large interest in the public sector. I definitely saw myself going to Washington after college, but did an internship in finance before my senior year and was very, very quickly hooked uh, in finance and was able to find a really, way, a really nice way to bridge my interest in the public sector and private sector by doing infrastructure finance. Um, a little bit about me personally, I grew up in New York um, on Long Island. I live in New York City now with my husband and our two children. I have a, a four-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter uh, that keep me very busy when I'm not at work at school. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Gasick. I am a class of 2020 candidate here, uh, focused on our asset management track. Um, so my background is focused mostly uh, in the portfolio management and trading space for basically all things equities and equity derivatives. Um, most recently, I'm working at PIMCO, uh, PIMCO Pacific Investment Management Company. Um, it's a global asset manager with about 1.9 trillion in assets under management. Uh, PIMCO is actually known for their fixed income investing. So you're probably wondering why is a equity person here uh, talking about uh, a fixed income firm. Uh, PIMCO actually trades and manages a lot of uh, equity uh, securities within their fixed income portfolios. Uh, so that's where my function comes in. Um, so I am one of five uh, on our global equity trading desk uh, out of our New York office. Uh, so basically all things that PIMCO trades uh, for equities funnel through my team. Um, we probably trade, um, actually I don't even have the notion on top of my head, but. Um, the interesting, the, int the interesting thing is we probably cover, between the five of us, we're covering 30 to 40 different portfolio managers ac across the globe. Each of them have their own uh, specific uh, investment strategy that they're managing, their own workflow that they're doing. Um, so we have to you know, constantly you know, put on different hats to change, uh, change what we're doing and kind of adapt to, to the environment. Um, previously to PIMCO, I worked at Mellon Capital. Uh, Mellon Capital is part of Bank of New York Mellon Asset Management. Uh, uh, the umbrella of, of, of their asset management arm. Uh, I was a, a associate portfolio manager within that group, um, and I was managing their systematic equity strategy. So anything that's you know quantitative, driven by you know a model, um, something that's you know a factor based, you know ETFs or like a simple passive uh, equity fund. Uh, I was I was a portfolio manager for that. Um, I am a CFA and Kaya charter holder. Um, and then from a personal perspective, uh, I grew up uh, outside the Hartford area. Uh, it's about an hour north from here. Um, and uh, uh, I've lived in San Francisco for a few years, but the majority of life I've been in Connecticut or the New York area. Uh, and most recently I'm in Stanford with my wife and my 10-month-old uh, son, Ali. 
I got a mic on my, on my sleeve here. I'm Ryan Sitars, class of 2020 as well. I'm a portfolio specialist at Voya Investment Management. For those of you who don't know what a portfolio specialist is, it's basically uh, a client portfolio manager, someone um, who does a lot of the business-related activities so that the portfolio managers of people who are actually running the money for our clients, trying to generate returns, they don't have to spend time uh, you know, talking to clients as much or working with marketing, putting together sales presentations, uh, uh, writing commentary, so forth, so that they can just spend most of their time trying to uh, you know, deliver the returns that the clients hired us to, uh, to achieve. Uh, so I work in the multi-asset group. Basically, we put together portfolios of stocks and bonds, liquid alternatives, with the aim of achieving some sort of objective. Target day funds are a big part of our business, so those are funds that adjust the stock bond split over time as you uh, reach the target date. Uh, basically changing the risk return profile automatically for investors. You'll oftentimes see them uh, in 401k, 403b plans. Um, you know, Voya is a, a bigger company, Voya Financial. It's got a, a retirement arm. So if you've heard of it, you probably have seen them as a record keeper in maybe one of your own 401ks or 403bs, 457s, um, some other uh, non-qualified or qualified plan. Um, we've got an employee benefits arm and then the investment arm, which I'm a part of. Uh, Prior to coming to Voya, I had some experience doing uh, wealth management stuff. Worked at an uh, institutional investment consulting firm and uh, worked, uh, started my career in investment accounting. Uh, worked as a FinTech project manager uh, for a while too. Um, like Mike, I'm from the Hartford area. Born and raised West Hartford, Connecticut. I did my undergrad at Endicott College, just uh, North Shore, Boston, uh, right on the water, beautiful campus. and. Uh, yeah, um, why I came to Yale, I guess, uh, you know, I was looking to broaden out my skill set. Most of my background, I'm a, I'm a charter holder too, and most of my background and, and studies were really in the finance area. So I was trying to get a broader range of, uh, of different skills. And, uh, you know, I thought Yale would be a great place to do it. Obviously, a fantastic school. It's uh, conveniently located. I also live in Stanford, so it's not too far of a drive. Um, and also my grandfather went here, so that was a big, big draw for me as well. Excellent, thank you. So uh, innovation and finance is obviously a very broad topic and may mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and to just share a little bit about myself and my uh, current role. So we invest in, uh, we invest debt in tech emerging growth technology companies. So what does that mean? Companies that have revenues from 100 million up to call it three billion. And I see everything across enterprise software, um, social media, consumer plays, hardware, semiconductors, marketplaces. So, you know, kind of in my day to day life of working with CFOs and CEOs of some of the most kind of prolific uh, technology companies that are being founded in the United States, everybody might have a different, you know, kind of spin on this topic. That being said, to kind of frame it for our discussion, um, we're kind of going to focus on how does capital drive innovation and how is innovation changing the financial services industry? Um, I think the World Economic Forum coined the phrase the fourth industrial revolution, which um, is generally uh, characterized by you know unprecedented, unprecedented velocity of change, data creation and processing power in terms of uh, computing. Um, I think I agree with them. I think they've even created an institute. Ryan, I know that you know, you've been in the space for a while. I think one of the other key uh, characteristics of the fourth industrial revolution that kind of separates it from you know, steam engines or uh, you know, assembly lines is the displacement of knowledge workers, right? So every other time we've looked at how technology has changed the way we've lived, it's helped us move things around. It's mostly been in a tactile world in the physical space. Now we're looking at you know, uh, the power of technology to outthink humans and what are those implications for the labor force, uh, for financial services and other industries. Um, are you seeing that and, and have you, um, you know, kind of experienced any of this displacement in your uh, career? Uh, yeah, absolutely seeing it. Um, personally, I haven't fortunately experienced it myself. Uh, you know, I've seen certain jobs get uh, eliminated, um, go into that, but you know, I, I mean, historically, you always see technology, technology changing the nature of jobs, and, and historically, people have uh, adapted and retooled to 
um, you know, enter into new jobs. You know, some, there are winners and losers throughout, but you know, the big question is, is it gonna be, um, you know, are there gonna be more losers than, than there were in the past? Essentially just, um, you know, not replacing those jobs. And you know, I, I'm not, full disclosure, I'm not an expert in this. I don't have a really strong opinion, but I think in general there, I kind of break down the jobs, um, three different functions. One is process oriented jobs, those are extremely vulnerable to being eliminated in my opinion. You got people oriented jobs that seem to be much more secure. And then like technology, technical expert jobs, which uh, high demand, but I think, uh, I think globalization will continue and uh, particularly in developed worlds, I think those folks um, need to uh, develop other skills across functional skills in order to be uh, really valuable. So from a process standpoint, I think operationally, if operations, jobs in general are, are gonna be challenged, right? If you're uh, transaction processing, accounting, if you find yourself doing the same thing every single day, kind of like a robot, it's probably a bad sign. <laughs> um, people oriented about jobs, I, mean, if, I think if you're at the revenue, if you're the one who can tie yourself to bringing in money, that's, uh, that's a very good thing. And you know, in, in our generation, I mean, maybe it'll be different 50 years from now, but I still think that people uh, want to talk to other people, especially when it comes to uh, their finances. And I think we're seeing like a good use case in robo-advisors, where you know, it, was, it was initially expected that, oh my God, they're gonna, you know, financial advisors are done, they're gonna eat all my business. You know, what do people need me for when they can just point and click and everything's rebalanced accordingly? Um, but what we're actually seeing is that you know, they're basically augmenting the financial advisor and helping them be better at what they do. Uh, so taking on smaller accounts that they don't really have time for, don't really bring in money for them, and free up time for them to do other value-added services. Um, and, and I'm hoping that that'll kind of continue to be the case. Um, but, you know, 50 years out, where basically people have grown up with this stuff and, and they have a different perception of machines, it, it's tough to make that forecast. It's so mm. far, far away. And then, um, and then the technical experts, I just think that, you know, coding has become in my opinion, uh, kind of a commodity, right? So mm. just because you know C++, that's fantastic. About a billion other people do in, in India, in China. Do you know the business? Do you, can you work with people? And, and you basically, I think the, the real winners are gonna be, I guess we could coin, phrase them as uh, innovators, the folks who can cross over. The, the business people who have some sort of technical expertise or the technical people who can interact um, skillfully with, with the business people and, and bring those together and, and really figure out like what is needed and then what is achievable. Mm, thank you. So, um, Mike, I'm going to extend the question to you and just add a little bit onto that. Um, you know, what are your thoughts, you know, on, you know, uh, human capital displacement as a result of innovation and have you seen this in your past? Um, uh, experience any of this, and what are some of the innovative products, uh, projects, excuse me, that you've worked on in the past? Yeah, so I would definitely echo Ryan's point, and I think I'm a, I'm a firm believer of you know, being having a combination of person and machine versus you know doing one all by people all by machine is the ultimate uh, combination. Um, for my type of role specifically, trading, trading is is definitely one of those areas that. Um, you know, you could see that it has been displaced over time, and I would say it's a living example. Um, I would say what's different in my role is, as Ryan kind of hit the point, is is um, focusing on those parts of your job that cannot be uh, automated and where you add value, and I think that's kind of how we are staying relevant um, within our broader organization and just the industry. Um, pivoting to your next question on just, you know, product developments and things that I've worked on in the past, I think the example I'm going to use, it's, it's dated, it's from five years ago, but I think it's relevant um, just because of its nature of sustainable investing and how that relates to Yale here and their mission uh, for uh, business and society. Um, so when I was at Mellon Capital, uh, I helped launch um, you know, their first carbon investment fund. Um, so just to step back, uh, for institutional asset managers who wanted to express some type of um, you know, ESG or sustainable view um, related to equity securities, what they would have to do is they would have to basically take, you know, an S&P 500 index portfolio and say, okay, I want to exclude the fossil fuels, I want to exclude the gun manufacturers, the casinos, um, and I'm going to hold a portfolio uh, without those names. 
But what's proven over time is that when you hold those portfolios over time, the, perf the financial performance of them actually lags its respective benchmark of the S&P 500. So um, that's kind of a red flag for these institutional asset managers um, in, a, in a conflict that they constantly have to discuss. Um, so what happens now with you know, the emergence of new technologies, and particularly to this case, uh, new data, um, we were able to launch a new fund um, that kind of changes the way that um, you know, investor may have to implement their, um, you know, their sustainability uh, thought. So instead of having to take that exclusionary binary approach, um, it's a way that um, they could incorporate uh, I think they have a more broad incorporation. So basically the way the fund works is that you take this universe of security, so to my prior example, say the S&P 500, um, and then you marry it in an optimization process with uh, MSCI uh, carbon data. So MSCI is a company that provides a lot of financial information. Um, they started um, working with large companies to collect data on their ESG metrics. So an example would be, um, you know, is this company like directly polluting the river that it's next to? Um, do its uh, employees travel, drive, or drive to uh, work an hour each way because that emits carbon emissions? That's not great either. Um, so basically, we created a model that scores all these different metrics, um, and it gives each company an assigned um, rating. Um, so when we take those ratings uh, and put them in an optimization process of the underlying securities that have each individually have their own risk and return characteristics, we're actually able to create a portfolio that has the same risk return like characteristics. Um, but have, like, I think the goal was like we had a 50% carbon reduction um, from an ESG perspective. So that was something that clients really liked. Um, and it's something that's still being used today. Um, it's much more granular outside of the process that I have that I previously described, but I think it's a way that, you know, an innovation and, and new data and technologies uh, uh, brought to the space. Thanks. So Jess, I know there's a lot going on in your space as well. What are you seeing um, currently uh, in terms of uh, different approaches to doing business? Sure. So I'd say something that I'm noticing more um, recently is continued innovation and evolution of existing products for different areas within infrastructure. Um, a recent example of this is something I'm looking at in the residential solar sector, uh, whereby they're taking asset-backed securitizations that have been used um, for a long time around mortgages and other consumer loan products and using them as a way to um, open up new sources of capital for these solar panel developers, which has been a really thematic theme the past couple of years. We've seen more than a couple billion dollars issued in solar residential solar ABS structures. Um, more generally, I'd say um, there's a lot of innovation coming off of policy initiatives. So it's kind of the financial market's reaction to various public policy initiatives to help leverage um, certain tax incentives or other types of credit enhancements um, to open up more um, private capital going into this sector. Are you referring to the investment tax credit at the federal level? Yeah, so there's a number of... In, and can you tell us for the audience <laughs> yes, to describe course. what that is? And there. <laughs> of course. So uh, the Department of Energy has released a number of different tax incentives to help encourage investment in new renewable energy. So um, specifically the investment tax credit and the production tax credit, which you often see utilized for financing of wind and solar. That's very prevalent. Um, so there's been a number of structures. Um, kind of the most prevalent one is tax equity, which I think you've got some involvement in as well, um, and we've seen a lot of capital been able to flow into those types of investments as a result of the, the, those types of structures. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Ryan, I'll open it up to you. Is there anything kind of currently that you're working on or excited about in the future as we kind of look at the landscape today and going forward um, within the framework of innovation and finance? Uh, yeah, sure. So work on several different projects. So. Um, I guess I've had two roles where I'm, I'm involved with product development in my career. The first was uh, FinTech product manager. And uh, I, I'll just touch on that really quickly because it, it was uh, a really, frankly, kind of antiquated system and it's extremely competitive market. And it was really difficult to innovate. Like spending a lot of money to be on the bleeding edge was not really uh, a good idea. We just would never catch up. So a lot of the innovation there was extremely client specific. It was like, what are your problems? What is this one particular client's problem? And how can we solve for that so that they, you know, we retain them? And then also, we would also try to uh, prioritize in terms of like, all right, how can we make this one fix and then add on a little bit something else to make it marketable to other clients or potential prospects? Um, so that was, uh, you know, what, not something that you would see in your innovator class. You're not going to hear a lot about that, but a really very focused uh, 
client-specific innovation. And in my current role, portfolio specialist, we do product development stuff. I'm working a little bit of ESG, um, alternative risk premium. Uh, a big focus for us is retirement income. So uh, it's a huge problem um, or a challenge. Uh, Bill Sharps called it the most difficult problem in finance. It's basically this uh, concept where you've got to try to make money last throughout retirement, right? People are living longer. They, a lot of Americans haven't saved enough money and um, you know, that we like to spend here in the US. So uh, how do you make that money last while well, giving people the, the retirement that they want, right? So target date funds, as I mentioned earlier, those help with the accumulation problem, hopefully getting people the money that they need. Um, but then how do you, um, you know, try to spend it effectively without running out of it before you die? And uh, there's so many different unknown variables, it's really challenging, like how long you're gonna live, what are the returns gonna be? Um, so we're spending a lot of time on that. And uh, it's, it's been really interesting. And one of, the, one of the biggest challenges for us is we have great ideas, but like when do we spend resources to actually uh, you know, put these into place? Because it's extremely costly. It's, again, it's this really competitive market. And if you look at most technological advances over time, there's usually like this, this strange looking curve where it's like an adoption curve where basically there's a, there's a runway. It takes a while for people to actually catch on. And then there's really sharp peak of interest and then and it drops off again as people are like, oh, it's not as going to solve every problem in the world, and then it kind of you know fades up a little bit more off into the distance. Um, you can think about like Bitcoin just being one of them, started in whatever after the financial crisis, and then it exploded and us down. Um, and people are like, oh, well, blockchain is still useful. You can think about the internet too, started back in the 80s and and World Wide Web kind of um, started in the 90s and then mid 90s uh, was really when the dot com bubble took off. Um, it can go on and on, but basically. You know, how, do we want to be the front runner or do we want to kind of follow, right? Because a lot of people, a lot of the real winners who are able to monetize these innovations aren't necessarily the ones who actually come up with it. So we, we grapple a lot over like, you know, do we want to be the first ones out here with this or do we want to, uh, um, you know, kind of take a wait and see approach, make sure that there's actually interest in trying to, you know, calibrate that decision. It's really challenging, um, but it's fun too. So that's what I'm working on. Thanks. Um, so, so Ryan talked a little bit about opportunities, challenges, risk, rewards. Uh, I'll throw it over to you, Mike. You know what what gets you excited about what's on the horizon, and and what are some of the kind of uh, risk and rewards of uh, those uh, opportunities? Hmm. You guys want to take this first? <laughs> Sure, so I'd say an area that I'm most excited in within infrastructure is certainly um, more activity in the U.S. public-private partnership space, so uh, P3s. Um, P3s are essentially partnerships between a public entity and a private entity for the development and operation for infrastructure assets. Um, while certainly they're not a, a novel structure, they have not been utilized historically in the U.S. Um, they're widely utilized in a lot of other countries, but in the U.S. they have not been. Um, but with the growing infrastructure investment needs and the gaps, um, innovative structures like P3s are really important to meeting the infrastructure um, needs. So we've seen um, a notable uptake certainly in the number of P3, the volume of P3, but also the kind of the, the range of types of assets we're seeing. So everything from airports, if anyone's flying into LaGuardia, that's an example of a P3. Um, maybe it's not a good example, but it's, it, it will be. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you, it will be. Um, We've seen a lot of student housing, um, privatization of certain types of assets within universities. So it's a very, very broad array of different types of infrastructure that are utilizing this pretty innovative structure to bring public and private together, um, kind of utilize the efficiencies of both of them. So that's definitely an area I'm, I'm very excited about. And thank you. Uh, so uh, Mike, you're not gonna get all free. Uh, <laughs> so you, I know you recently participated in a uh, competition uh, that was uh, focused on financial markets, and I think there was uh, somewhat of an uh, innovation spin to that. I'm gonna ask a broader question. I think that every country in the world is focused on this because right, innovation drives GDP growth, right? Over long-term labor and capital, have diminishing returns, and the only way that you're gonna get long-term economic growth is by investing in technology, right? So that's kind of a national security issue. Uh, I know it's a major priority to us here at Yale. We have the Size Center for Innovative Thinking, and a lot of capital's been poured into that and trying to figure out how do we kind of develop and create and cultivate um, an infrastructure for the creation of new ideas and new businesses. It doesn't even have to be for-profit, could be non-profit here at Yale and create a center for excellence around that. Um, 
kind of just share with us a little bit about your experience, right, in the program. What have you been doing? How have you been uh, becoming engaged on campus in some of these uh, innovation uh, initiatives? So I guess for me specifically, I think this competition was a good way to, um, you know, really look back at what we had done at Yale for the past year and a half and really um, apply that knowledge for a project that, you know, lasted over several months. So it's not just doing an assignment or a final, like we are actually working on something and creating a solution that, um, uh, you know, that actually has real impact to business and society. Um, so I think from that perspective, you know, participating in these case competitions, these pop things, I think it's all good. Um, what was, uh, I would say, what was eye-opening to me through this, um, you know, this case competition that we participated in, it was myself, it was Ryan, Adam Perlack here in the audience, and, and Benga, who's not in here today. Um, it was a, it's, it, it's a, a, a portfolio competition that was facilitated by McGill University in Montreal. Um, and basically what they did is their pension funds put out a case of uh, real relevant issues that uh, Canada pension funds are facing today. Um, the theme of this one uh, was balancing the needs of return objectives, uh, sustainability objectives, and uh, you know, continuing to support their local economy, uh, just with Canada being focused on fossil fuels and oil and gas. Um, there's, there's conflicting interests with uh, all three. Um, so for us, it was interesting. We got to, you know, we engaged Roger Ibbotson. He's one of our, uh, he was our faculty advisor and one of the professors for our class uh, investor that you take in year one. Um, and he was helpful uh, to, you know, get us off the ground and help shaping a solution that, you know, would, that would be, uh, we could focus our efforts around. Um, and I would say one of the best parts, um, you know, working with him is, you know, we, we, in using our experience as executive is that we are able to create something that's very practical, um, implementable, um, and, and realistic that, you know, that was relevant to Yale's uh, business and society mission. Um, Excellent. Thank you. So <clears throat> I want to leave some time for the uh, audience. Uh, and before I turn it over to uh, the folks here in the room, I guess I would just ask one final question to each of the panelists. Um, kind of light, you know, uh, why don't you tell us something that uh, we can't find out about you on the internet via Google, Facebook, or Instagram and ladies first. Thank you. Well, this is a very hard question to prepare for, so I've decided to go with the most <clears throat> random fact I could find out about myself, and I had to ask some parents. <laughs> um, so when I was younger, my grandmother was really good friends with a, a famous artist that paints collectible plates. That's that's a thing, and so my four and five year old face appears on a series of collectible plates, um, nice. often <laughs> in like a bit of a cherub type of a situation. Yeah. <laughs> It's awesome. <laughs> Very random, but yeah. Um, so what I, when I had to think about a fun fact for myself, I think the first thing I realized was that uh, I'm probably the least interesting person here out of all the class, especially after listening to everybody you know, over the past year and a half. Um, that being said, um, I like long walks on the beach, uh, <laughs> getting caught in the rain, and the, mo the notebook. <laughs> Excellent. Pina coladas. <laughs> okay, it's true. You, you are the least interesting person in the class. I thought I was, but... <laughs> um, uh, so, one I, uh, I'd like to share is, I've, over the last couple of years, become uh, a lessitarian. And you might ask, what the hell is a lessitarian? Anyone know? Interesting. So essentially, but it's applied specifically to meat. And basically, I just try to eat less meat and love meat. I just want to be clear with that. I'm not trying to push anything, but um, it's... You know, there's a lot of really good reasons to try to eat less meat, a lot of environmental benefits. Um, you know, I, I think, basically, I try to cut out one meal a day um, with meat. And if I look out over the, a year, I basically am taken down, I project like about 20 less chickens, uh, a quarter less cow, and like a couple less turkeys. And, uh, you know, if you magnified that over, you know, an extremely large number of people, it's a, that's an incredible uh, difference in um, the, the amount of uh, animals that we consume in a uh, quick stat is that the, you know, the methane emissions from animals is about on par with the, all of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from all forms of transportation. We're talking cars, trains, airplanes. So it's it really shocking. Um, and then there's a lot of health benefits too. Um, I don't want to go on, but, but basically I've actually felt better doing this. Again, don't give me any crap if you see me gobbling down a burger later because I still love meat and I still eat it. But I try to cut back a little bit. and. Um, I've shared this with a couple other people. 
um, that the most compelling um, uh, story that I've, I've uh, seen about it, well, the benefits of plant-based diet, it's a, a document on Netflix. It's called uh, Game Change. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really good. So. Excellent. With that, oh, we'll open it up to the uh, audience for questions. Hey, you look great, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I should probably uh, take, take on some. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. I have a question for each of them, but I will take my turn. Um, the first is for Jess. Um, so I'm actually really intrigued by what you're doing. It kind of applies to something that um, a fellow student and I are working on with an independent study. So we've, we've been working on um, opportunity zone investing. So I know you've obviously been related to some tax incentive um, uh, you know, tasks and that sort of thing. Um, they've actually been talking about that there's, for actual operating businesses, that there's been a shift from just doing real estate deals to more infrastructure deals. I'm just curious if you guys have been seeing anything like that or if there's a trend for people to start looking in that space to sort of utilize that tax credit um, in general. Sure. We've, we've seen kind of very little of it. There's um, one company in specific that I've been speaking to, I'm happy to make an introduction to you, that's focused on um, opportunity zones for infrastructure. Um, what I generally focus on is pretty large scale infrastructure, and those tend to be more kind of local, smaller projects. But um, on a certain scale, it might make sense for large institutional investors to go into. Um, but we can chat after, and I can make that introduction. Who's next? Not everyone at the same time. <laughs> yes. So, Mike, <laughs> if this this is kind of related to finance and, and innovation, if you had a son or daughter who was 16, 17 years old right now, who said that they wanted to go to college and they want to work on Wall Street, they want to be a big trader like you when they grow up, would you tell them that that's a good idea? No. Yeah, I think you actually bring a great point. So. Ryan touched on it earlier where the skill sets have changed or the skill sets have and are changing. So I think, you know, traditionally speaking, the people who came into these jobs usually studied finance um, or something more technical engineering um, who went into these jobs. Uh, now what you're seeing is that people are coming out of um, more computer science based uh, um, backgrounds and coming into this just for the need of, uh, of the increased uh, technology and innovation aspect. So that being said, I would say you probably see now teams with, you know, balanced backgrounds, which is helping, you know, the case for, you know, person and machine. Um, but if I were, if, if, if I had someone who, or was talking to somebody who was thinking about going to this type of role, I would say it's almost a baseline at this point to, you know, have a, a, a background in both. Yes, sir. This one is uh, to Ryan balance a little bit. You mentioned something really, really important, right? That uh, uh, the people that can move the needle today, they, they are not just doing technology or just doing business, but they are able to bridge that gap. Uh, my question to you is, where do you find those people uh, that have that? Because generally, those are things that don't go necessarily together, right? You are the more of this or more of that. Uh, how do you find those people? And if you're, if you're not able to find them, how do you train them so that they can uh, have that other aspect of their uh, skill sets? Mm. Yeah, I, I think you find them in places like this room right here, to be honest. <laughs> um, but no doubt, they're, they're rare, uh, and that's why they'll be extremely uh, well paid and, and compensated. You know, I think, I think you're going to see, like in general in the labor market, it's, it's kind of weird. You're, you're seeing like this uh, bifurcation between a wage growth from on the, on the sh um, low end, you're seeing actually wages rise uh, for like extremely menial jobs like that are like blue collar but require um, physical labor that you can't really outsource. Maybe that's because of some minimum wage issues. But and then on, on the other end is, is these folks who are extremely talented. And they're able to cross borders. Uh, maybe they're able, able to lead CEOs, again, the technical experts that have some people skills. Um, you definitely, most people are going to have, they're going to be better at one than the other. Um, but, you know, I think you just got to be a, a lifelong learner. That's kind of the way I, I've looked at it. And you've got to uh, you know, be really interested and hungry to, uh, you know, break outside your comfort zone and, and learn new things. And, you know, for, for me, uh, I've seen people who, who are, who I think are those types of people. And 
you know, they're, they're not, that doesn't mean you need to be a computer scientist. They don't need to actually be able to code, but they really need to understand, you know, how those folks think, um, you know, how you would spec out a project or, um, or basically get them to work with you because there's, a, you know, really uh, different cultures in a tech company than, than a finance firm. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you're able to speak both languages, which is an acquired skill, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how you develop it. I think you just got to dive in and in, in search and find your own way. But um, you know, those, yeah, those are going to be really valuable uh, um, people in, in, in the future. Excellent. Yes. Did you have a question, Anne? Did, but you, you already answered it in some ways. Uh, no, so I, I was thinking through, you know, you spent a lot of time uh, collectively studying CFAs, CAIAs, and all this stuff. Uh, do you see the need to be, uh, you know, going and shifting into the more technology space? And, and is there anything that you've done in particular to help learn and develop your and kind of reskill in some ways? And I can even broaden out that question, right? So I think the theme that I heard. Uh, in your response was kind of fintech versus tech fin, right? You know, is, is it the disintermediation of financial services by technology companies, or is it the appropriation of the technology by, you know, traditional firms, right? So where do you guys kind of, and I know we're not fortune tellers here, but where do you guys kind of see that going or playing out, or, or is it some type of combination, or what are you seeing in your own firms? I, so I would say, from my perspective, I would say like on a trading desk, what ultimately the job is, you're a, a human and you are using a collection of different tools to do your job. Over time, that collection of tools has become a lot more technology driven. Um, and it is still, I think there's a lot of runway for that to continue. Um, that being said, I like, you know, back to my prior point, um, you know, having a computer science background is important, um, but it's not necessary. I think if you're somebody who can develop, as Ryan said, you know, and be somebody who can speak the language and bridge the gap, um, you know, you can ultimately be a, a leader of those people to, um, you know, create those solutions. So I think that's I'd say, where I'm seeing in my job. All right, so I think we are at uh, time. Really uh, grateful for all of your participation. Thank you very much.